So I guess we're changing gears a little bit here. I want to talk to you guys, but actually, I want to talk to maybe one of the minds that you have deep inside of you that maybe you've been tucking away. Your most curious mind. I want to talk to your inner nine-year-old, your inner 11-year-old. Okay? Think about how curious you were when you were 11. Now, who am I talking to? Am I talking to your, your inner 11-year-old now? I hope so. I hope so. I want to talk to you about technology. Technology is kind of a heavy subject for a 9-year-old or for an 11-year-old. At least it was when I was 9, right? Why should you have to wait until you get to university to learn about technology and invention and innovation? Why can't you learn about it as a nine-year-old, right? Well, I want to bring a few ideas here. I want to try to capture your, your imagination of what technology is and try to bring you a definition of technology that, as a nine-year-old, will probably resonate with you quite easily. So I want to tell you that technologies are extensions of ourselves. They're extensions of ourselves. My shirt is an extension of my skin. My glasses are an extension of my eyes. My car is an extension of my legs, right? I think as a nine-year-old, you can grasp that. But I thought, you know, you can state it, but as a nine-year-old, you'd probably rather play it, wouldn't you? So you could play a game. You could take a look at what these technologies are and you could try to figure out, well, if technologies are extensions of ourselves, then what is it that they're extending? Which sense is the technology extended, extending? Which human faculty? Right? And interestingly enough, nine-year-olds can play this game, and they can beat these levels. So they can learn early on that technologies are extensions of ourselves. But that's not really enough. That maybe gives us a loose definition of what technology is. But to go further with it, you need to get to a process of invention. I have a second level for playing around with technologies as extensions of ourselves. And you'll notice that in some of these bins, some of these bins are two cents bins. So the two cents technologies go in the two cents bins, and the one cents technologies go in the one cents bins. And as a nine-year-old, you can probably figure out on the left there that that pair of glasses probably belongs in the box with a pair of eyes on it. And you can probably figure out that the TV, if you can recognize that as a TV as a nine-year-old, probably fits in the box that has the eyes and the ears on it. Right? And you can play this game. And we can sort of twist this game around a little bit in many different ways and get lots of practice at it, even if, as nine-year-olds. But to know that technologies are extensions of ourselves isn't quite enough. Technologies are also recombinatory in nature. Every technology is made of other technologies. Every technology is made up of components, and each component is also a technology. And each of those components is made up of components, which is made up of components, and on and on forever, right? So that's maybe a little bit abstract for a nine-year-old. But I don't think this game level is. I think most nine-year-olds that I've exposed to this level are able to do this. They can take two things at the top there and figure out what it might look like to combine them into a third thing. Okay, And they can play this on their own, and they can figure it out. And it certainly pushes their, pushes their perspective of what each technology represents, because to combine them together, they have to think about first what is being extended, and then through the recombination, what senses are being combined. We can twist this game around too and have fun with it, right? Technologies don't all have to be complex. We have a lot of simple technologies around us that we can play with, that we can think about, and we can make all kinds of different game levels that kids can play so they can learn early. So now we've kind of gone through two things. We've gone through this idea that technologies are extensions of ourselves. And we've gone through this idea that 
technologies are recombinatory in nature. But that's not really enough, is it? It's not really enough. If we want to push the boundaries, we have to get into something maybe a little bit heavier. And I struggled for a long time with how we might make something as heavy as disruptive innovation theory, as heavy as a theory, be understandable to a small child, to a nine-year-old, or to your inner 11-year-old, right? Now, this is my only slide with plenty of text, so I need to tell you in just about two minutes what disruptive innovation is. And the way to do that is to tell you what sustaining innovation is. So you can think about two different types of innovation, right? Sustaining innovation, that's what those big established firms do. We call them the incumbents, right? They make products better. Those of you who are engineers, you probably learned your whole career how to make things better, right? And when we think about invention and engineering, we think about making things better. And that's what sustaining innovation is all about. And if you want to do that, then the place to go is to go and work for one of these large, established incumbent corporations, okay, and make the world or make the products better. But that's not what disruptive innovation is about. Disruptive innovation is quite different. And it's created, actually, by the behavior of those incumbent firms. So as those big firms make those products better and better and cater to their best customers that have the highest needs, they create this, this huge hole in the industry, a vacuum, and a giant sucking sound. And what does that sound pull in? A bunch of entrepreneurs. And what do those entrepreneurs do? Well, they see, hey, these, these incumbent corporations following these sustaining innovations, making products better and better, catering to their best customers, right? offering more functionality at a higher price. They're neglecting all of the marginal customers. right? The marginal customers are the ones that, you know, they don't really want a better product. They just want a basic one that they can afford. And so disruptive innovators, entrepreneurs, figure out how to make a product that's worse. They figure out how to make a product that is lower performing than established products out there, okay? And even though it's lower performing, they figure out a way to compensate for that lower performance by adding some new dimension of performance. And in standard disruptive innovation theory, those other dimensions are simplicity, customization, convenience, and especially affordability. But how do you get a nine-year-old child to think about disruptive innovation? How do you make a game out of it? It's kind of tough. And I struggled with it for some time. And I came to create this visioning exercise. And I used this tool in the classroom quite a few times. And exercise one on the left there that's maybe a little bit cut off, let's call that the disruptive innovation. And the one on the right is the sustaining innovation. So let's start with the one on the right. So tapping back into your nine-year-old mind now, let's play, the, let's play the game. So for exercise two, you want to look at that blue circle, and you want to think about a very simple technology, something that you have around you, maybe a pencil, maybe a pen. Okay, And the purpose of sustaining innovation is to make it better, so you can think about how to make it more sensual. You can think about a pen that better matches the shape of the hand, that can better flow on the page. You can think about how to make a pen more visual, right? You could think about changing the shape of the pen, changing the color of the pen, changing the way that it, that it writes. It's easy to think that way. And in every, in every instance that I've, that I've tried it, it's very easy to get a classroom of students or even a classroom of children to think in this way. But if we go to exercise two, I mean, pardon me, exercise one on the left that's a little bit cut off, it gets a lot harder. It's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to think about how you can make that pen worse and still retain some sense of innovation in it. Right? How do you make that pen write more poorly? How do you make it sound worse? How do you make it feel worse? This is not a process, a mental process that's normal and natural in people. And yet, that's actually the kind of thinking that's needed to do disruptive innovation. And so if we're going to if we're going to try to create disruptive innovators and entrepreneurs who can really succeed out there, 
We'd like to start training them early, wouldn't we? And so it would be really nice to have a game level that could do this. And I'm not saying I've sort of figured out the panacea, but I'm trying. And I'll take you through an example, because that was probably a little bit too abstract, especially if you're still in your nine-year-old mind. So I won't do the one on the left, because it's sort of a classic McLuhan example. I don't know how many of you know who Marshall McLuhan is, but some of these ideas are taken from there. Let's do the second one, right? So you've got the old TV, and it's transitioning into this big screen TV, right? So what have we done here? We've expanded stimulus over existing senses. We've improved the product along a traditional dimension of performance. That's sustaining innovation. It's hot. Why is it hot? Well, it's hot because it's increasing stimuli over existing senses, right? It's becoming hypnotic. It's becoming hypnotic. The big screen hypnotizes you and draws you in and stops your mind from thinking. But the other example, to the right of it, the YouTube example, although YouTube has been heated up, but if you think about the old YouTube, right, it's very cold. Right? The visual dimensions are poor. The audio dimensions are poor. You've got this amputation of the senses rather than an extension. You've got an amputation. And how does YouTube make up for it? Well, by reactivating your brain and allowing you to search and to decide what it is that you want to watch, right? And that process is a lot different from hypnosis, and it's a lot more like hallucination, right? Because you're the one adding the content in the middle. And so my message or punchline for you all is that we need to get kids thinking about these things early on so that we can reshape their minds so that by the time they go to become entrepreneurs, they don't fall into the path of sustaining innovation, which tends to be unsuccessful. And instead, they choose disruptive innovations. And the way to do so, I believe, is to have them think more deeply about how senses interact with technologies. And you should know that I think we're all better off disconnecting ourselves a little bit from these hypnotic technologies. And we're all better off hallucinating a little bit more and making up our own reality ourselves. Thank you for your time.